Okay, welcome back to our special CUBE broadcast here at AT&T Park, a home of the San Francisco Giants. And I'm here with the Senior Vice President and CIO, Bill Schlau, with the, with also Chairman of the Board of the, the San Jose Giants. Welcome to the CUBE. Thank you, John, good to be here. So innovation and big data uh, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You're known in the industry for being very innovative and a lot of high profile uh, write-ups on you and the work you've done here. Can you tell the folks out there a little bit about what you guys have done here? I want to dig in some specific questions, but you have a real innovation strategy behind the Giants, and share with the folks out there what is your innovation strategy, and what are some of the things that you have in place here? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, since I first got here uh, 15 years ago, one of the things that attracted me to the Giants was in the mission statement of this organization. Uh, our mission today, it's tweaked a little bit, but is we're dedicated to enriching our community through innovation and excellence on and off the field. And I thought it was pretty unique 15 years ago for a sports team to have innovation in their mission statement. And one of the things that really attracted to me and me to the franchise. And I'd say whether it's our ownership, a lot of whom made their fortunes through technology, or our fans, a lot of them who work in the industry and, and kind of expect, uh, expect a facility that pushes the envelope, we really feel like that's part of our core is to be experimenting and pushing the envelope from a technology perspective, whether it comes to technology for the fan experience, technology to drive our business forward, or technology to improve the, the product on the field. Yeah, obviously San Francisco is booming with technology and we're hearing all kinds of stories. It's a south of mission, it's just exploding with tech companies, the tech fan base, but you guys have to be technical as well. So I got to ask you, how are you using technology as a competitive advantage and how do you motivate yourself and your team to have that mindset? And what is that mindset as a leader to be innovative? A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure in this sport, a lot of money uh, to be won and lost on the field and off the field. How do you maintain that edge? What's the mindset and what kind of things do you tell your staff? I guess it's interesting that you call it pressure. I don't think of it as pressure at all. I just really think of it as opportunity and I think of it as, you know, that's what gets us up in the morning, gets us excited to come, at the, come to work at the ballpark every day. I mean, it's, it's exciting to come to work at a ballpark anyway, but when you're doing the same old, same old every day, um, that's not going to get your juices flowing. What's going to get your juices flowing is doing something new, something no one's ever done before in your industry. Um, and, and we get a lot of ideas from other industries, to be honest. It's not like, I don't think there's anything we've done here that no one has ever done before. We learn and we repurpose things that maybe a different sports team has done or maybe a different industry has done. Um, but really, I think from our CEO down, we're all encouraged to, uh, you know, to take risks and it's okay if we fail but we're all encouraged to really push the envelope and I try to strive to set that same example for my staff. I emphasize all the time, innovation is in our mission statement. It's expected of us to be innovative and it's not just technology innovation. It could be innovation in promo items. It could be innovation in our food delivery here, but it's, it permeates the whole organization. It comes from our CEO and, and drives all the way down. So Intel has the cadence of Moore's Law doubling every you know, couple of months or years, however it goes. Well, every organization has a secret sauce. What is the secret sauce of the Giants? What, what makes them unique in its own DNA of the culture here in the organization? Man, uh, I don't know that I, that I want to reveal it. There might be some Dodger fans or, or maybe even <laughs> Red Sox fans sitting beside me that want to pick up on this. This, is, this, this might be a personal question here. Um, I would say that uh, you know, the DNA, it, it's really the history of this franchise going all the way back to 1883. There's a lot of pride uh, in the San Francisco Giants. And, and it also goes back to the time when when the Giants almost left the Bay Area and almost went to Tampa and become, became the Tampa Bay Rays. And the ownership group uh, back in the 97 time frame saved the Giants and kept them here in the Bay Area and ultimately built the first privately financed ballpark since Dodger Stadium in 1958. That's this ballpark we're sitting at here right today. And so that mindset started with the ownership group when they came in. And I think, uh, you know, secret sauce is, is, you know, we're all not afraid to fail. We're rewarded for pushing the envelope and it's, it's really expected of us. So I don't, I don't really know how to say more of a secret sauce than that. You know, it, it's, it's in our mission statement, it's in our DNA, it's who we are and it dates all the way back to 1883, you know, when the Giants were founded. Uh, so Bill, let's talk a little bit about data specifically. So obviously there's a lot of data flowing throughout this building. Uh, there's data, you know, from our, all the, the cell phones out there and the, the audience. There's, I'm sure, sensors all around the ballpark. Um, then of course, when we've got games going on, there's stats being created, potentially. Um, how do you look at data uh, as a competitive differentiator and, and how you could use it, I should say, to, be, to, to differentiate yourself both on the field and kind of running your business? What's your overall uh, philosophy when it comes to taking advantage of all that data that's being created on and off the field? Okay, I, I wouldn't say there's one overall philosophy, but I totally agree with you that 
data is everywhere here at the ballpark. And, and you touched on three different areas right there that I can just highlight briefly. One is on the field. And on the field, you know, for years, uh, you know, folks have been focused on the traditional statistics. And then sabermetricians came in and came up with all these different, new and different types of stats or profiled in Moneyball or, or you might hear about today. Um, but we really feel like there's an opportunity to capture some data that has never been captured before. And we've been experimenting in that area for a number of years with a local partner. And again, back to the secret sauce, I really think that's part of the secret sauce too, is, is geographically being here in the Bay Area. All I have to do is walk down the street and I'm gonna bump into four people who have great creative ideas. And, 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 and some folks in other markets may not have that advantage. So um, anyway, as far as the data goes, you know, capturing data that's never been captured before. So we're using cameras to track data and, and capture literally, you know, billions of data points a season in terms of the movements of players and the ball on the field. And that's something we feel like every, every team is going to be there in a few years, but it's something we've been experimenting with for, you know, three or four years at this point. There's no such thing as a sustainable competitive advantage to us. It, it's something that maybe you have a one to two year edge, but we want to take those risks. And so data plays a big role in that. And we've won two World Series out of the last four years, so we feel like, you know, Maybe we're doing something right on that front. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned you mentioned Moneyball. I, I wonder. Talk a little bit about the you know in the in the movie in the book. There's this you know kind of this tension between the scouts, the traditional way of scouting players, and then the kind of the geeks, the stat heads, and their approach. Um, I wonder, did you find that to be accurate? I mean, what was it like? What is it? Has it been like? Kind of bringing data into the equation when it comes to you know player scouting and kind of analyzing play on the field. Was it that stark, or was it a little bit more subtle uh, conversation? Um, I think there's a lot, that, that, that movie was closer to reality than a lot of people think. Um, I think that's, it's quite true at a lot of organizations that there are uh, some old school scouts. But what's interesting about the old school scouts is they rely on data just as much as the new school or the younger scouts. Now let's say somebody who's purely focused on statistics. Okay, that's, that's one type of data. But the old school scouts may be formulating their own data and capturing their own data, but just they, they probably don't even realize that they're doing it they're looking at biomechanics and they're making calculations without even realizing it. And they're, and they're looking at the makeup or the character of a player. And those are really important data points. And so the challenge for us and for all teams is to figure out how to quantify what was heretofore unquantifiable and was in the heads of these old school scouts. And so I don't really know that it's a, um, you know, that it's a really a battle. It's more of an education process and, and and, but we definitely have a good mix, and our, and our GM himself has been around a long time, so he sees the value of both the old school and the new school, but I don't think it's really kind of, you know, heads banging as was portrayed in the movie. Well, it strikes me, I mean, in organizations beyond sports franchises, you've got, you know, this, this, this tension between kind of the old way of doing things and institutional knowledge that, you know, is, is still very valuable, but bringing in data, and, and there's a change management um, challenge there, I think, in, in, in terms of bringing the old in with the new, and it sounds like that's something that's you know happening here in your organization and, and the league as, as a whole. I mean, I, I'll give the credit to our GM, you know, Brian Sabian, the longest tenured GM in baseball right now. And uh, we've got a lot, of, a lot of people who've been here a long time, and we take pride in that, you know, people don't leave this organization. And uh, I give credit to him. You know, he's old school, but he's also smart enough to surround himself with folks who aren't old school and can bring him the data and he's open-minded enough to, to take everything into consideration. And that's really the key. And, and we're seeing it out there with the IT market. We have a lot of customers here from HP and other around Silicon Valley. That modern era is upon us. They talk about that in baseball, the modern era of baseball. So it's super exciting. We have some questions on Twitter that are coming through. One came in. Uh, in, a in, in, in my world, this is from Paul Crawford. In my world, big data equals petabytes plus. Question, what data sources at scale are being used effectively in sports? And I guess I would add a little tack onto that is, do you use proprietary data acquisition? You mentioned you have cameras, and do you public sources? So private sources, you probably hoard those for a competitive advantage. So what yeah. is the scale of data that you guys are doing? Just to kind of order of magnitude. Yeah, good question. And it really depends on what aspect of the business we're in. The baseball side, we're dealing with video, and video takes up a lot of space. And also in the, in the fan experience with the broadcasts and the, and the video board here, you're storing a lot of video. And in that space, we're not talking about multiple petabytes, but we're talking about, you know, the hundreds of terabytes range in that, in that space. Um, then we can go to the business side. And in the business side, when we think about data, primarily it's, it's ticketing data. Ticketing is kind of the lifeblood of the organization and uh, capturing as much ticketing data as we can. And a lot of that comes from a mix of sources. It could be you're doing a transaction in the primary market on our website. You could be doing a transaction at StubHub. We want to capture all that information and leverage it to make better decisions and, and, and to 
quantify the you know the total value of our customers. So, but that's not that's not it's not like video where it's large quantities of data. So that's maybe you know terabytes, tens of terabytes, but not as much as the video. And then the last area for us, of course, is uh, you've got the on the field and you've got the uh, pl the uh, business, and then you've got the fans. So as far as the fans go, we're not hoarding any of that data. We're, we're tapping into a lot of different data sources, social media data sources, et cetera. But we're not, we're not, we don't have a data center that, that holds all that data here. Well, we'll get you guys a free version of our crowd chat program for sure. Get that, that, that plug in there. Um, so let's get back to the three areas of, of organization, team, and fans. Um, give some examples of, of uh, what we call tech athletes, people who are in the technology field, who are essentially athletes doing things like what you're doing. A lot of work involved, whole new level. It wasn't just, you're not just punching cards anymore and, and swapping out disks. IT's not that anymore, it's much more comprehensive. It's pretty mission critical for your, your organization, the team and the fans, right? So yeah. what are the new tech athlete type roles that you have and what are some examples of things that you guys are doing in all three phases of that of the, of the pillars, the organization, the team, and the, the fan experience? Okay, I'll, I'll give you names of the athletes, three I got three, one athlete in each of those areas I can profile. Yeah. I'll start with my predecessor, the first IT chief for the Giants. His name is Jerry Drobny. And when I got here, he moved over into marketing and ticketing area. Now, that was 15 years ago. Fast forward 15 years, and I'm not sure exactly what his title is. He used to be director of interactive marketing or VP of interactive marketing or digital marketing. But what he's doing is taking data to make better decisions in the ticketing world. And he's doing an incredible job of it. Started out in the early days for us, uh, we were innovating in the secondary market. Before StubHub existed, we created a secondary market called Double Play Ticket Window. Then we moved into dynamic pricing. And he is using data to make better decisions on a daily basis, but to perhaps on an hourly basis to make better decisions with pricing because we're always dynamically pricing our tickets. And then now we're moving even into the world of seat upgrades and recycling of tickets and all of that is in, is in the hands of that athlete, Jerry Drobny, who's been with us 20 plus years now. Um, so that's one example. Number two, uh, let's look at the, on the field. On the field, the athletes, uh, I'll go with a guy named Ishaya Goldfarb, who works in our baseball operations group. And again, his title is probably Director of Baseball Analytics or something along those lines. And he is taking the data from all kinds of different sources. We, I can't have enough application developers for him or data acquisition sources. He's got a list that we can never catch up to. And he is trying to use all different you know, types of tools to make better decisions, leveraging you know, the sport vision data I was talking about, um, data comes from the league, all kinds of different data. So the third-, third is, he a, is he a data scientist? Or is he kind of a practice, learning on the job? Statistician, data scientist, he, he, he wasn't schooled that way. Nobody ever leaves here, so he's been yeah. here you know, 10, yeah. 15 years. He's now um, the data scientist. <laughs> yeah. So on the fan side, I would say Dave Woolley, who works for me, and his, uh, he has the longest title of anyone in the company, I think, his, uh, title is uh, director of, uh, uh, he is enterprise architect and director of strategic IT initiatives. And he oversees all of our wireless efforts at this ballpark. And that is really key to us. We've sold out 246 straight games at this point, And we feel like being here at AT&T Park, enabling fans to stay connected is one of the reasons why the fans keep coming back. So Dave is responsible for de deploying all of that architecture, all that infrastructure, the wired, our new brand new brocade network we have here, our 1,289 Wi-Fi access points, our distributed antenna system, all that is, is in, under the auspices of, of that athlete, Dave. And that's not trivial, the Wi-Fi, is it? Uh, no, it's not trivial <laughs> work-wise, financially, I'll give, you know, there's been a lot of press lately about what we're doing here with iBeacons and you know this new concept of Bluetooth LE, and it's great. I'm happy to talk about it, but Bluetooth LE took about a day and a half to deploy, if that. Wi-Fi, we started that while we were still in season last year in September. We finished about a week ago, all, all off-season long, millions of dollars um, to make that happen. To, to make a ballpark wireless requires a heck of a lot of wires and a heck of a lot of organization structure behind the scenes. Yeah, you know, people oversimplify how hard that is. Yeah. Staying one step ahead of it is the toughest part. You don't just put it in and it's good to go for three years. No, if you're if you're lucky, it'll last one full year before you got to upgrade again. Uh, so let's dig into the last one a little bit more around the customer uh, customer expectations uh, when it comes to the fan experience. How do the how do customers kind of push you to innovate? I mean, you've got um, you know people kind of expect things to be simple. Google likes simple uh, to have all these services at their fingertips. Um, how much is that kind of driving the innovation you're doing here around fan experience? Um, and how do you look at that as, uh, again, I'm, I'm curious kind of, you, you're here in San Francisco in the Bay Area, again, you're probably ahead of the game uh, compared to some of the other major league franchises. Maybe you could kind of put in context, kind of where are, where's the league in, in general when it comes to leveraging technology to kind of improve the fan experience? 
I mean, I, I think all the major sports leagues recognize that it's an imperative to leverage technology to compete with the couch is the, is the popular term. And we don't really want to just compete with the couch because the couch is our product too. I mean, we want to provide a great experience for the, for the folks who are watching at home on the broadcast. But I feel like because of the market here and because of, you know, we, we were a Wi-Fi hotspot at this ballpark, the entire ballpark opened it up completely in 2004. In 2004, three years before the iPhone debuted, the only mobile devices that people brought in back then were the Compaq iPack and the, the Palm, I think the Zyre came out right around then. <laughs> the, that Apple, was the Apple Newton was around, I think, still. <laughs> might, might have been. People bring in Commodore, Commodore 64s, I don't know, but uh, the bottom line is we debuted that opening day of 2004. And it took another, it's 2014 now, 10 years later, a majority of ballparks don't have that Wi-Fi infrastructure mm -hmm. in place. It's not normally a 10-year advantage, but I'd say we're generally because of our fans, because they come expecting to be able to stay connected, particularly they come expecting to see an HD screen as opposed to a small CRT. I'd say expectations are probably one to two years ahead here in the Bay Area. I think every park will get there, but it's just like, our fans uh, expect more of, of all the franchises. It's not just me. It applies to Dave and John and the Niners, all the, all the teams you'll talk to today. Bill, you know, we were talking before you came on about how we love technology. We, we, and we're geeks. We love to geek out on innovation and the next wave and something modern. Um, and we were talking about the art and the humanization aspect of data. And that's a big discussion that we talk about on the queue. The human element is still a big part of it. You still got people involved in all these operations. And my wife and I were watching Trouble with the Curve last night as we were channel surfing with Clint Eastwood. And you know he, he's almost blind, but he can hear that the guy's got a hitch in his swing by the sound of the bat. That's kind of an old school thing. So how, talk about the, the art side of the game, the people piece of it. How do you blend that cultures together? How do you bring technology with the spirit of baseball, the church of baseball, that culture. I would say, uh, you know, when, when you ask that question, I think back to when we were building the ballpark and, and we surveyed our fans and our best customers, and we do a lot of that, and we ask them, when you come to the ballpark, you know, tell us about the experience you want to have at this ballpark. Do you want to have a flat screen in the seat in front of you, wherever you are, and do you want to be, you know, ordering food to your seat, and do you want to be accessing replays and all this? And, and a lot of them said, no, I do that all day at work. I want to get away from that when I come to the ballpark. So that's why we didn't force that on you. Instead, what we love about wireless is it enables fans to have the experience they want to have. It's, it's kind of bring your own technology. So that's really been a focus for us. We still have an out-of-town scoreboard where folks walk around and manually change those numbers. That's not because we're too cheap to put in an LED board out there. It's because we want to preserve that, that old school feeling. Uh, and we do that with a lot of things. If you look at the field, there's no lines on the field. Uh, we, don't, we don't mow different patterns in the field. That's a, a tribute to the, to the uh, old days of the franchise. We don't put names on the back of jerseys. There's a lot of things we do to kind of still stay in touch with that tradition of the sport and, and call on balls and strikes. I mean, if you watch tennis, you got the Cyclops that can call a, a, a ball that's out. Of course we could do that here with technology too, but you know, as a league, we've chosen to, to preserve some of the tradition there. Okay, some more questions from the Twitter sphere. The business of baseball is much more about the gate, football about TV rights as a commentary, and then the question is, how does the business of baseball differ from da a data standpoint from other sports? I would say, you know, one thing that's very different in baseball versus the other sports, and I was talking to Dave about this beforehand, and he was saying, you know, we found that actually our fans don't spend that much time during a game on their mobile devices. Because soccer, you know, it's uninterrupted play. And if you're looking at your device and, and staying in touch with something, you might have missed the only goal of that game. Baseball is very different. You know, we got you know, nine innings at least. You got 17 inning breaks, um, a three hour game, two and a half hour game with 20 minutes of action. That's it. And so there's a lot of time in a baseball game to enable our fans to to activate with social media, to walk out to our app cafe, to be involved with whatever we're promoting and, and, and engage with their devices. So I'd say that's one of the biggest differences is the way fans enjoy our game. It's very different from soccer and different from basketball, especially as well, those high-paced games. Okay, I gotta ask you about social media, obviously, so we're on the cutting edge of it with Twitter, Facebook, and other environments now. You can broadcast out and I see selfies of the rage and David Ortiz was taking a selfie with the president the other day. and. Uh, Social media, how is that impacting how you think about the broadcasting or the sharing of the game, the love of the game, the data, uh, the rights, all the above? I mean, it's pretty wild west. So what's your, what's your take on social media interactions, engagement? 
marketing? What, yeah. what can you share there? I know that I know that uh, Major League Baseball historically focuses a lot on broadcast ratings, and we compare ourselves to the other sports. And it's tough to compare yourself to Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is much more than just a sport; it's an event. Um, folks who aren't even football fans at all are there watching the Super Bowl, at least watching the commercials or hanging out there with the TV on. But for us, I like to think that a lot of a lot of the younger generation, a lot of folks. They're not, they're not turning on the TV to engage with our product. Social media is how they're engaging, or online video, or snippets, or whatever it might be. So we're really looking to those channels to try to be where our fans are. And we built our at cafe out in left field last summer to really showcase our engagement with social media. And this year, our newer innovations are with a partner called Tagboard, where we're really showcasing and, and curating comments to throw up on the main main video board, the Diamond Vision, during games, and to showcase how fans are engaging, to encourage it through our app, the Apple Ballpark app, while fans are here. Um, we really, you know, another area is security for fans who want to report issues in the ballpark. We really have our text fair or foul program. It's very popular with fans. So we find that fans more and more are engaging um, through mobile, and we're trying to be, you know, where our fans are. That's great. Well, my, my final question for you, and I'll let Jeff uh, answer it, ask, ask his final question is, um, what do you love most about your job? And what would you share to the folks watching that might be a CIO in, in a bank or an enterprise uh, who have the same challenges? They have the innovation strategy. Maybe it's not as sexy as baseball, but maybe you know, it's still the same big data uh, innovation strategy. What would, lessons would you share with them? And what would you share with them that you love most about the data aspect of your job? Okay. Uh, it was like three questions there, I think. So, so what do I love most about my job? Uh, you know, working, we work long hours. A lot of folks work long hours, but you know, we've got 81 games and, and we start our business day the same day and time as anybody else does and it ends maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, but we come to work at a ballpark every day and we're not curing cancer, but it's pretty clear what our mission is. I mean, we're here to win a World Series and, and, and to provide great entertainment value for the fans. And when we do, you know, we, we wear the ring. And, and that's pretty cool. No stock options for us. Um, we're not going to get rich. We may not be able to afford a house, but you know, our fans all, our, our friends all want to be us. And so that's pretty cool. And that's why our turnover is as low as it is. As far as the data side goes, well, I who gets the ring? We all do. All, all front office, full time staff, part timers, interns. The DBA gets the ring. The DBA has a ring. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> um, same thing. I presume with the folks at your Red Sox, will will be just as generous with their staff. But you know, from a data perspective, I do think we all face the same challenges. Uh, you know, but what gets up, us up every day and, and what I want to have wherever I go is, is passion for the product. And that's what we have here. Yeah, and just kind of playing off John's last point, what, what advice would you give to CIOs or you know, other technology executives out there that maybe are in different industries? Um, you know, if you could pick one or two pieces of advice uh, based on your experience in the last several years, kind of uh, transforming a lot of the ways lower waste things are done here at the Giants uh, using technology, using data. What are some of the things you've learned, whether it's from a technology perspective, uh, you know, a change management perspective, or, you know, responding to your customers, in this case fans? Um, what are one or two pieces of advice you could share? So two pieces of advice, these are kind of macro, but um, I would say number one is don't be afraid to fail and encourage your team to push the envelope and take risks and, and learn from them and try new and different things. So just because a technology is not proven or a, or a startup company hasn't, hasn't uh, you know, worked with six other companies doing the same thing you are, take that risk, give it a shot, because that's the only way you're gonna really you know, make a revolutionary change, I think is number one. And number two is build relationships with your counterparts at other organizations, not just in your industry, but in a lot of different industries, so you can compare notes. Pretty much every day, I'll pick up the phone and call one of my counterparts or, or somebody in a completely different industry who I've built a relationship with and say, hey, how are you tackling this problem or this challenge? And I think we all have more in common than we have different. And that's what I love about working in my industry is we compete on the field, but off the field, we collaborate every day. Fantastic. Bill Schlau is SVP CAO of the San Francisco Giants. Thanks for joining us on this special CUBE broadcast live at your park, AT&T Park here in San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.